the uh, Saddle School lesson for the first quarter of 2013. The principal contributor, as I mentioned earlier, is uh, James Gibson from uh, Geoscience. And uh, the editor in general is Clifford Goldstein. And uh, there's a whole bunch of people that are listed at the end of that. Um, and I'll just put them up. The uh, first lesson is Jesus, creator of heaven and earth. And, uh, and then there's a whole list. There'll be one on the first three days, on the next three days, on creation, a biblical theme, creation of morality, creation in the fall, uh, through glass darkly, Jesus provider and sustainer, and one of the points that uh, will be made there has to do with uh, the idea that God made the laws of the universe and walked off and left it. Uh, not really a biblical idea. Marriage, stewardship in the environment, the Sabbath, creation and the gospel, and then finally creation and the new creation. The uh, memory verse is Genesis 1.1. 1, 1. How many of you know that verse? Uh, well, let's say it together then. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Or as the uh, original Hebrew would be, Bereshit bara Elohim Hashemayim, excuse me, et Hashemayim ve'et ha'aretz. And the first comment is only something greater than what it creates could have created it. Thus, only a being greater than the universe could have created the universe. And that being is the God who is revealed in the Bible. The God whom we worship and serve because, among other things, he is our creator. We also learn that this God, the one who created the universe, the one who has spun those billions of galaxies across the expanse of the cosmos, is the same one who has come to Earth to live among us as a human being and even more amazing to bear in himself the punishment for our sins. Sometimes we hear of things that are too good to be true. What could be better, though, for us as sinful beings in a fallen world, painful world, than to know the wonderful truths of our Creator's love, a love so great he would come down in the person of Christ and link himself to each of us with ties that can never be broken. In response to such a wondrous truth, how are we to live our lives? In the beginning, and there's our memory verse again. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. There are many deep truths in that simple text, one of the most profound being that the universe itself had a beginning. While that idea might not seem so radical to us today, it goes against the long-held belief in an eternally existing creation. Not until the 20th century, when the Big Bang model of origins took hold, did the notion that the universe have a beginning gain general acceptance. Until then, many believed that it had always existed. Many people resisted the concept of the universe having been created because that implied some sort of creator. In fact, the name Big Bang was intended to mock the notion of a created universe. But the evidence that the universe had a beginning has become so strong that nearly all scientists have accepted it, at least for now. Scientific views, even those once deemed sacrosanct, are often changed or refuted. And while there are a lot of questions about the Big Bang, I want to outline two things. One of them is the Big Bang is a best case scenario for those who do not want any change in the laws of nature. That is to say, it's possible that some kind of plasma creation actually did the creating of the universe. Or for that matter, a divine fiat. Uh, or maybe they're not mutually exclusive. Exactly how God did the creating, we don't know. And we uh, may not even know after we've had a chance to view the video. But if you take the present matter that we have and project it backwards in the past, it comes down to a point. There are those who might wish it had come down to a near miss, but uh, Stephen Hawking, of all people, and Robert Penrose, demonstrated that, in fact, it doesn't do that. And uh, so if you try to make matter as eternal as possible, 
the maximum you get out of it is 20 billion years, and most people say it's more like 13.7 billion years. The second thing uh, that's also true and has often been forgotten in the controversy over the Big Bang is that according to all that we know, the second law of thermodynamics holds for everything, which means that if the universe were eternal, it would be at heat death by now. Think about that a little bit. That is to say that even if the Big Bang gets destroyed somehow, we find out that the redshift has nothing to do with speeds at distance. We still don't have an eternal universe, at least not one running by the laws we know. And now, I would like to have somebody read Hebrews 11, verse 3. And uh, when you have it, raise your hand and we'll give you a microphone so that you can hear. You have it there? Through faith, we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God, so that things which are seen were not made of things which do appear. What does this verse tell us about God and the creation of the universe? Go ahead, Sean. That he's invisible, I guess. At least to us. That uh, what he made the universe of is invisible yeah, to made us. Yeah, made it out of nothing. <coughs> yes, we have a comment from Gilbert. I think this is, I think this is a good prelude for uh, atoms and, and genes and things that we can't see without uh, spatial devices to make their presence known. But they wouldn't have guessed that at the time it was written. But it makes perfect sense today. I don't know. I, when I read that, I find it fascinating that, uh, that the uh, ancient Greeks would have a great deal of difficulty with that. But modern science, not so much. Because we uh, have the equivalence of matter and energy. And energy, of course, is not uh, seen, certainly not easily seen. As with Genesis 1 and Hebrews 11.3, pardon me, as with Genesis 1, Hebrews 11.3 is full of mystery and things that are unexplainable by a present knowledge, but probably a little bit easier understood by a present knowledge than, than previously. Yet the text does seem to tell us that the universe was not formed from pre-existing matter. The universe was created by the power of God's word. That is, both matter and energy were brought into existence by God's power. Creation from nothing is known. Well, that's literally what it is translated as ex nihilo, is simply out of nothing in Latin. We uh, often credit humans with the creation of various things, but we humans that do create a few things always do it out of something else. We're incapable of creating from nothing. We can change the form of pre-existing matter, but we have no power to create ex nihilo. Only the supernatural power of God can do that. This is one of the most dramatic differences between gods and humans, and it reminds us that our very existence depends on the creator. In fact, the verb created in Genesis 1-1, bara, comes from a Hebrew root word that is used only in reference to the creative activity of God. Only God, not humans, can do that kind of creating. And uh, it says, see also Romans 4.17. And maybe if somebody wants to look up Romans 4.17 and read that. If you have your quarterly, you can look ahead and have your Bibles ready ahead of time. Otherwise. We can wait. 
We have a, we have a fast Bible student here. <laughs> Romans 4.17 says, As it is written, I have made thee a father of many nations, before him who he believed, even God, who quickeneth the dead, and calleth those things which be not as though they were. So it's something that God can do to call something and call it forth from what it was not. And uh, that's about as good a description of creation ex nihilo as there is. Yes? I got a question for, as about this um, creating from nothing. Um, I think it's a little bit hard to understand. It might be a little bit contradictory, too, because if God could create from nothing, couldn't he fix a lie? Because isn't that the definition of a lie, saying that there's something there when there really isn't? I would say no. Why? Um, I think it's better to say that all things came from God and he is something. Well, supposing I tell you that I will be here next week. It's not there. What? I don't understand that. I will be here next week. The future is still ahead of us. It hasn't actually happened. So is that by definition a lie? No. I'm calling something that is not. No. But, but that will be in its but proper if, time. if the time goes by and you end up not being there, then it will be a lie. Well, but that's different. Why? You see, because when <laughs> God calls it forth, then it is. So God can do anything, so that answers it. Not, not anything in that kind of sense. Well, what sense are you talking about then? But, uh, but anything, if God, if God says that he's going to do something and then it happens, then uh, th that doesn't make God a liar because it wasn't true when he, at the precise moment he said it. What? I don't understand that. Um. <laughs> I'm sorry. In other words, in other words, God's word is a promise that will be fulfilled. And he'll fulfill it. Yeah, but you can fulfill a promise with things or with when you don't have something or when you do have something. So uh, why can't you just say that you do have something all the time? And, and that's one of the reasons why, by the way, uh, James advises us to qualify our own promises with if the Lord wills, we will do this or that. Well, I, I think it's fine to say though, that God always existed, and so he started with himself, which is something. Right? Well, that's See, how I look at it. So I, I, everything has come from God, and he is something. So it technically, he's not creating it ex nihilo. He's creating it out of himself or out of his word or something like well, that. Well, you can't go too far because that's pantheism. But, but all I can say is that... that it may not come from some, nothing because nothing is kind of like a third person out there. Not entirely. Yeah. Well, yeah. Uh, we have right. a couple of other commenters here. Mm, may I uh, suggest that what we have traditionally called nothing is actually not quite so, because when we think of something, we usually think of things. We don't think of words as something. But when we think of information, that is also something. And in fact, today, we know that information is far more powerful than mere things. By a few keystrokes, you can make all kinds of things happen. Um, and that's just information. And, and why be limited by keyboard? You can just speak into a microphone computer can interpret your speech and act accordingly. That, so you have converted information into action. Interesting you should mention that. Yesterday I spent quite a bit of time speaking to a computer and having words appear on the screen. 
There you go. So why should we have a problem with God says, and it is so? I mean, he has much better understanding of how to make things happen. If we have a problem with how, that's our problem. That's not his problem. We have another comment over here. Not to stir up an argument, but we passed rather quickly over the fact that it said God created the universe. I know full well there are many who don't believe that. Even if they believe he created the earth special, they don't believe he did the universe. So rather than let it lie, I would like to know what the, the central issue is in denying that God could create the universe. Is it time or space? Or, and then the follow-up is, uh, why would we limit God to just being able to create the earth without creating the universe? Can we hold that thought for a little bit later? Because uh, we're going to actually outline some of the reasons at the very end. Good. Thank and you. then we'll uh, come back to that question. But it is a good question. Another quick, uh, quick slide. Uh, yes. You know, Paul does say, as far as the last question is concerned, that in God or in him we live and move and have our being. It's almost like every atom, every particle, every bit of information or energy or anything that we would call something is all dependent on God and uh, his existence and his knowledge of it and that uh, we we almost <coughs> live and everything exists within the mind of God. It's almost like a mental projection. It, it seems that uh, everything is indebted to God for its existence. Every And Ellen White also says uh, something similar that uh, all nature has a signature of God on it from every atom to every larger thing or every smaller thing. It's all indebted to God. So in some ways that kind of explains it where you know god creates based on his own uh it's not on, not completely out of nothing it's based on his own eternal existence his own power well you're actually right um and interestingly enough um i cornered robert piccioni when he was here uh physics professor um and uh, asked him how they are among other things, how they're trying to get uh, relativity and quantum mechanics together. And um, the final answer was that the universe is actually discontinuous. Uh, what that means in plain English is that it's digital. And uh, what that means is there's no particular reason why we couldn't be in a giant computer type simulation. And lest uh, that seem too strange to you, get into a really well done computer game and start playing it and see if you don't get sucked into the world, which suggests that we could easily get sucked into this world and the information is the funda uh, fundamental property of it. And uh, in fact, uh, uh, according to the best physical theory that there is apparently, uh, digital information to be precise. Yes. The <coughs> Paul, uh, the lesson starts with Genesis 1.1 and God created the heaven and the earth. And the next thing you know in the lesson is they talking about the creation of the universe. Genesis 1.1 to my understanding and talks about the creation of this earth and the solar system. Uh, Shamaim, Hashamaim means the sky. God created the sky and the earth. The Hungarian Bible happens to use that expression. So <clears throat> I am just, I was totally taken aback when the lesson writer, it's probably Clifford Goldstein, it's not Jim Gibson. I, if you read this lesson, you can't find, I would not believe that Jim Gibson would write some of the things that are found in this first lesson. <clears throat> would. Uh, would launch into the universe. We know so little about the universe and we know so much about this earth. Why not stick to this earth and the solar system? 
and, and talk about it well, <coughs> instead of, and uh, also the whole posture of this first lesson is a defensive posture. We, we go on right away trying to defend our stance on creationism. I so wish that at once we would take the positive approach and assume that creation is the way things have happened and go on from there. So we spend our time apologizing. <clears throat> I will say this, that I think that a little bit of a defensive posture is probably appropriate, given the fact that there are a lot of people who really have trouble in that regard, and including a lot of Adventists. And uh, this first lesson, I think, has more defensive posture than any of the other ones, at least as far as I have read and understand mm -hmm. them. Um, it appears to me that the, uh, that the further along you go, the less defense and the more it, is, it pulls creation in as an assumption and then takes off from there. So I think that we'll see that. And, uh, yeah, we'll be going into the various reasons why people might want to view Genesis 1 in different ways and what different ways there are. Um, and th this is a question that's given for Sunday night, but at the very end, I'll, or at least at the end of the quarterly, they'll pull this out again. Why is a supernatural creator, one who exists above and beyond the creation, the only logical explanation for the creation? And it says, bring your answer to class on Sabbath. So when you come to the Friday, they'll have a, a series and they'll ask this question again, or they'll refer to it at least. The heavens declare, and the uh, quote is from Psalm 19, 1 through 3. The heavens declare the glory of God. While we're at it, if somebody wants to look up Romans 1, 19 and 20, and we can have that read too. The heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament showeth his handiwork. Day unto day uttereth speech, and night unto night showeth knowledge. There is no speech nor language where their voice is not heard. And uh, uh, again, if we can have somebody read Romans 1, 19 and 20 in this context. Romans 1, 19, verse 20. Because of that which may be known of God is manifest in them, for God hath showed it unto them. For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Uh, it's interesting in a couple of, that particular text is interesting in a couple of ways. One of them is, is eternal power and Godhead are the only things that are really mentioned. The idea that there is a uh, division of labor within the Godhead that uh, is, is certainly not easily derived from nature. Um, there, the idea that God loves us is not easily derived from nature as it is now. Um, certainly there are hints, but there are other hints that, that go the other way. And I think one of our job as believers in general and as Adventists in particular is to be able to proclaim that in fact God does love us. All of us, even the ones who will eventually turn against him and even after they turn against him. It's just that some of us won't receive it. That's all. But that's not evident from nature. All, all that you can say from nature is there's something beyond nature that is extremely powerful, extremely intelligent, and extremely knowledgeable. And uh, the... Uh, question is asked, uh, how have you experienced the truth of these texts? And if somebody wants to comment there, uh, now is your chance. And then it also asks, how has modern science helped us even mo to even more appreciate the power and wisdom of God as creator? Um, and uh, I think that depends on how you define science. But uh, 
Uh, we have a comment over here. When, when you study the work of an artist or a musician, or life of an artist and a musician, you study its works. When you study God, you, you do theology. Theology is the study of God, and there are subsections of the study of God. Apologetics, New Testament, Old Testament. Another subset is the works of God. Science is study of the works of God, okay? That's the relationship. So any scientist, whether he is religious or not, he and she religious or not, whatever they uncover about nature, they have contributed to our study of God. So that's the relationship between science and religion. Yeah. <coughs> I think the only problem that we have is that it's a bit like studying, uh, well, let's say Henry Ford by looking at a Model T that has been kind of been left in the field for a while. Um, you do see marvelous design. You also see decay. And you might even see where somebody has shot at it, bullet holes or something like that. And uh, you have to be careful not to derive the character of Henry Ford from the bullet holes, because they're not his. Uh, I think when we look at nature, per se, and so on, there are certain things that tell us uh, that there is a designer and that there is goodness and so on. It's, it's not all bad out there. Uh, I recall a former Adventist who had become an atheist uh, telling a group of us that, uh, he says, well, I don't know. I said, I'm no longer with you. He says, but sometimes when I hear music and appreciate it, it makes me think that there might be a God. Uh, there's that aspect. Uh, when I see flowers myself, uh, or uh, enjoy the songs of birds and so on, uh, I have a hard time saying, hey, uh, that scientific data is not saying there is a God. It, I think there is that data that seems to suggest that it true is it's terrible uh, evil out there. And I look at the teeth of Tyrannosaurus Rex. Uh, you look at that side also, but it's not all negative. The heavens declare the glory of God. Um, how are we defining glory? What does glory mean here? I think of a verse in uh, somewhere in writings where Ellen White says the glory of God is self-sacrificing love. So I'm thinking, okay, does that substitute fit into this sentence here? Um, it talks about the heavens also, rather than the earth. And I'm thinking, well. Earth has been contaminated. The heavens maybe haven't been contaminated. What do we what do we see in the heavens that we might not see in Earth? Uh, and again, what what is the glory of God? What is it? What is this declaring? Now you're getting into our family. I believe there's chaos in heaven when I see exploding stars, etc. My wife says, no, if you understood it right, it's something else, order. And then she suggests that what we might be seeing in chaos is there was war in heaven. We don't know anything about that war, whether there were supernovas or catastrophes occurring that might just now be coming to light. It's an interesting thought.
the um, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth if you look at it from a purely physical point of view it almost becomes a parlor parlor trick God snaps his fingers and there's a the universe golly I think the more perhaps the more important question is why did he create a universe that might help answer other questions I don't know if the lesson's going to go into that later on. I have not read it. Well, um, I don't think it does go into that, and probably the reason is because a question like that uh, may be beyond the reach of, of uh, human knowledge at this point. Well, there's a kind of a short, trite answer. I mean, he. It says even in the Bible, he made us, at least humans, for his good pleasure. So maybe the same is true of the universe. He just made it because he wanted to. It gave him pleasure, at least originally. Love by nature requires other, others to interact with. So if God is love, by definition, he almost has to have a creation and that takes on a whole different purpose and meaning in this and the glory of God is, is it has to do with this love well perhaps um, I mean in the Bible it seems to indicate at least two families of God one with the angels and um, heaven wherever that is and one here on earth that has kind of gone badly awry, although the heavens did too. Raises an interesting question of whether there are other families uh, who haven't had the same problems we have. It's not just through love that, that uh, God creates. It's that love creates. That's the characteristic of love. It is a creative <laughs> How should I say? Force. Uh, among us, we know we humans, through love we procreate. It's a strange thing. My wife and I were married for a while, and you would think we should be just happy with that. Yeah, after a while, we were walking through, you know, the malls, and somehow I see these baby faces. I've never noticed the baby stores before. And I was looking at all these goo goo gagas, and she's saying, are you getting clucky? You know what that means? I don't know how. I don't know how that developed. I mean, we didn't even expect Timothy yet. We didn't even know we were expecting it. I just somehow instinctively developed this idea how nice it would be to have a baby, you know. Isn't it interesting? And, and that's, you know, it, it's something that is born from love. It's love that makes us creative. It gives us also, it's part of that image of God that we have, uh, uh, that has been, that we've been blessed with by God. Paul, um, if I just may Sorry. give you a short answer to the question <clears throat> that you asked. Uh, in the Bible, there are two in the beginning texts. One is Genesis 1 1, the other is John 1 1. Uh, my contention is that the Genesis 1 1 text refers to the creation of our solar system and our earth, but the John 1 1 refers to the beginning of the universe or before. And so we project that there was a time when there was no universe, there was only the triune Godhead, no time, no space. And <clears throat> We can well appreciate that the tri triune Godhead loved each other, they're independent persons, and they fulfilled each other's needs. And so if the Godhead simply seeked fulfillment and happiness and satisfaction, nothing more needed to be done. Everything was just fine. And the creation began of the universe and this earth <clears throat> out of a love, as, as was mentioned elsewhere, of sharing the joy of existence. The Lord envisioned and came, brought into existence a universe and a world 
that was very pleasurable to live on. That's our belief. <clears throat> and of course, the Job 38, 7 text gives us assurance that when the creation of this earth was happening, the sons of God were watching and shouting with joy so that we were created into a pre-existing universe. This earth was created into a pre-existing universe, populated presumably with other beings. I don't know if he's, are you worried about this being the beginning of all things that we're talking about with um, Genesis? Or are we, or can we look at this with quite um, confidence that this, not, this isn't necessarily the beginning of all things? Well, um, again, I'm going to try to put some of that together at the end, and, and then we can discuss it at that point. Well, the other thing I wanted to say is that um, it, when you talk about creation, you're talking about the works of God. If you, if you look all through the Bible, it seems like the issue is always about works, about what kind of works you have done, what kind of fruits that you produce. An evil person produces bad fruit. A good person produces good fruit. And, um, and it just seems like when we're invited, when we look at the Genesis story, what kind of fruit is God producing here? That's, that's what we're looking at. And it may, have, it may have some connection with the end times also in that um, we're going to have an argument on who is the best person that produces fruit. In Job, there's a suggestion that uh, a number of atoms of other universes or worlds met with God and uh, the devil of Satan uh, came and joined that as being the, quotes, uh, uh, atom of this uh, planet. I, I think that's probably true. Not just any kind of universe would be capable of supporting life. In fact, it seems that the universe must be extremely well designed in order for life to exist. First, just beyond the position of the, uh, the earth and stuff like that, the building blocks of all matter, atoms, must be stable enough in order for stable material objects to be created. The stability of atoms depends on the forces that holds the parts of the atoms together. Atoms contain charged particles that both attract and repel each other. The forces of attraction and repulsion must be carefully balanced, especially in the nucleus where you have protons that repel each other otherwise pretty strongly. If the attractive forces are too strong, only large atoms can form, and there would be no hydrogen without hydrogen. There would be no water and thus no life. If the repulsive forces are too strong, only small atoms can form, such as hydrogen, and then there would be no carbon or oxygen. Without oxygen, there can be no water and no life. Carbon is also essential for all forms of life as we know it. Not only must the atoms be stable, but they must be able to interact with one another to form vast numbers of different chemical compounds. There must be a balance between the forces that hold the molecules together and the energy required to break up the molecule in order to permit the chemical reactions on upon which life depends. Uh, if they glom together too much, you can never get them apart. If they uh, fall apart too easily, you can't make anything hold together. And so again, you have a balance. The precise fitness of our universe for life has gained the admiration of scientists and has led many of them to commit that the universe appears to be designed by an intelligent being, including some people that would really rather not. I think it was uh, Fred Hoyle, who's an atheist, who famously said the universe appears to be a put-up job. The world must also have been wisely designed in order for life to exist. The range of temperatures must be compatible with life, so the distance from the sun, the speed of rotation, and the composition of the atmosphere must all be in appropriate balance. Realizing that we're looking at a post-flood world, 
you have to wonder what the pre-flood world would have been like when God specifically planned everything. Many other details of the world must be carefully designed. Truly God's wisdom is shown in what he created. And again, we're looking at a Model T that's been shot up but, uh, uh, and it's been sitting for a while. But uh, you, you have to model, marvel at what it would have looked like when it first came off the assembly line. The power of his word. Read Jeremiah 51, 15 and 16, and Psalms 33, 6 and 9. So if anybody has a Bible. Mm -hmm. By the way, if you can see well enough, I have a Bible here that somebody can read. It's a small print. Paul, Paul um, <coughs> the, the life, the word life is what we know about life is what we know here on earth. We don't have any example of life outside. So the word universe and life don't fit together. Okay? That's, uh, that's the first point. The second is... Well, at, at, least, at least our life. Exactly. Uh, angelic life exactly. may be slightly different. So, so what is this? You know, th this just doesn't mash. If we talk about life, we should talk about things we know about something. And we don't know anything about, as you say, angelic life and life on other... <laughs> Uh, words. But going back just to the previous pages, what is this attractive force is being too strong and or too weak and that will uh, cause certain types of atoms to form or not form? What is this all about? I, I totally lost the writer at that point. Well, th think about it. Supposing that the bond between hydrogen and oxygen was no, so no. strong it could not be broken. No, no. A as you know, uh, 10 to the minus 14th mm -hmm. atoms in water come apart and leave a hydrogen in one place in a, correction, 10 to the 7, minus 7. Yeah. Um, I'm talking about the nuclear forces. They're talking about here the attraction between, attractive forces between the nuclear, in, within the nucleus. If they're too strong, there'll be big atoms possible or the other way around. That, of course, I know nothing about. And I, I just totally lost me here. Part of the anthropic arguments for the origin of the universe. Mm -hmm. And, and of course, this is presuming that atoms are created in stars and, and so on. And, it, and it that is. We, we don't have anything to do with that when we see the Lord created the earth. He created all the atoms, small and large, all at once. And so this is, this is just a hodgepodge. <coughs> well, the, the thing I will say is this. Uh, that if these, uh, let's say the attractive forces were stronger than they are the sun would be, have to be smaller than it is in order to give us the same amount of heat. You would have to balance the size of the sun versus the size of the, and uh, perhaps if they were stronger than they are, Jupiter would start putting out light too. Um, we might come to the point where any planet bigger than so big would be, uh, would be subject to starting a thermonuclear fusion. I think what Dr. Yavor is saying, though, is that uh, God could have created the rest of the universe completely different than how he created our little planet here. Uh, he could and, create, and create us with our own unique atoms, you know. And that is true. That and is uh, true. And so, but I think a lot of people like to say that we're similar to the rest of the universe. Now, to, be, to be honest, the idea that we are the same as everything else is, is an assumption. Uh, the, one, the one thing that gives us a certain amount of confidence in that assumption is that if you go and look at star uh, spectra, it looks like they have the same lines that are, that are caused by hydrogen or calcium or some other element um, in, their, uh, in their spectra as, uh, as we have now. And so the natural first assumption is that they're built the same way. Now, I agree with you. I think, that, I think that one of the things we have to be careful about is making this too marvelous because the fact of the matter is that if God created the earth, he didn't have to do it out of the dead bodies of exploding supernovae. Yeah, yeah I, I, I think there's compatibility in the universe and, and when we will be allowed to travel to other places, we'll feel f quite comfortable. And <clears throat> I, I would expect that. So, so basically, I was just urging uh, this kind of a discussion to talk about mm -hmm. things we really know something about. 
life, for instance, and, and leave the universe alone, as someone else mentioned, we know so little about the universe. We see these electromagnetic waves coming at us and explosions, what we interpret as explosions. But, but nobody's been know. to Alpha Centauri, for example, let no. alone the rest of the universe. 25 trillion miles away, yeah. Yes. I, I was just going to mention the similarity of the spectra, atomic spectra, from other galaxies and so on, uh, does show that there is some relation to what we find here, to the universe. Dr. Game. I just, I'd just like to respond to Dr. Yavor. The only thing that I think this particular paragraph should be included, and it's important, is because that particular concept, uh, anthropic principle for the fundamental constants of the universe, had convinced the majority of physicists that at least God exists. Regardless of biology on this planet or anything else, the, the fine-tuned features of the fundamental constants of the universe that are known, there's like 200-something of them now, have convinced the majority of physicists that at least there's a God, including Frederick Coyle. He used to be an atheist, and at least now he's a deist. So. And, and the interesting thing about that is it's a direct uh, fulfillment or a direct demonstration, if you prefer, of Romans 1, 19 and 20, that the things of God are, in fact, plainly seen, at least that he has power and majesty. Love's a different matter. It's a little harder to make that case, but... Uh, but power and majesty are there, and there, you know, the uh, the idea of a creator is, uh, the physicists have no problem with it, and the the physicists that don't like it don't like it for entirely non-physical reasons. Uh, Doctor Gan, uh, there's two verses in uh, John se uh, chapter 17 where Christ is praying to uh, his Father and says, "Give me the glory that I had with you before the beginning of the world." So what was that glory? Uh, something obviously existed, perhaps other world, obviously the universe, perhaps other beings, we don't know. But something that gave him great glory. Well, uh, has, does anybody have uh, Jeremiah 51, 15, and 16 at this point? He hath made the earth by his power, he hath established the world by his wisdom, and stretched out the heavens by his understanding. When he uttereth his voice, there is a multitude of waters in the heavens, and he causeth the vapors to ascend from the ends of the earth. He maketh lightnings with rain, and bringeth forth the wind out of his treasures. And uh, that kind of suggests that there's wisdom, and there's... Or Power, but also wisdom. That's um, kind of like information. And the voice seems to be prominent in, in that. And then somebody with Psalm 33, 6 and 9. Psalm 33, <clears throat> 6 through 9. By the word of the Lord were the heavens made, their starry hosts by the breath of his mouth. He gathers the waters of the sea into jars. He puts the deep into storehouses. Let all the earth fear the Lord. Let all the people of the world revere him. For he spoke, and it came to be. He commanded, and it stood firm. <coughs> So uh, what other attribute of God is mentioned in the creation besides wisdom? Don't know the answer to that one. But I got into a furious debate with a professor at the seminary over the phrase, God is love. Ellen White says, every act of God is an act of love. And so I assume that God was love. The professor said God had an attribute of love, meaning he could have other attributes as well. We never came to a final truth, though he chose to flunk me 
<laughs> Interesting. <laughs> which, which could have been a final truth. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's final academic truth anyway. Yes. <laughs> After he promised he wouldn't punish me, he did. <laughs> but, but this is a... This is a thing that's preyed on my mind for the last 40 years. Um, could God turn on me in a fit of anger? Could he do something other than love? And would be destroying me in a fit of anger be an act of love? Some would say, sure. <laughs> well, uh, uh, let, let's save that one. Uh, and if we have time, we'll get back to it, because I think that there is actually a good biblical text that, uh, that uh, gives us a, a really good idea of what God does. Though we cannot know exactly how God created, we are told that it's through his powerful word. All the energy in all parts of the universe had its origin in the word of God. All the energy in all our fuels came from God's power. All the gravity throughout the universe, every star guided in its course, and every black hole, which are still theoretical, result from God's power. We've never seen anyone, and we never will, of course. Perhaps the greatest amount of energy is within the atom itself. We are justifiably impressed by the power of nuclear weapons in which a small amount of matter is converted into a large amount of energy. Yet scientists tell us that all matter contains large amounts of energy. If a small amount of matter can produce the vast energy of a nuclear weapon, consider the amount of energy stored in the material of the entire world, but this is as nothing compared with the energy stored in the matter of the universe. Imagine the power of God that is utilized to bring the universe into existence. And me as uh, understanding physics, I, when I read the word power, I immediately think of power is the ability to do a lot of work in a very small amount of time. Many scientists believe that anything God may do in the creation is restricted by the laws of nature. But this idea is contrary to the Bible. God is not restricted by natural law. Instead, God has determined natural law. Natural law is the way God usually works. God's power has not always followed the patterns that we call the laws of nature. For example, one of the fundamental laws of nature is the law of conservation of matter and energy. This law states that the total amount of matter and energy in the universe remains constant. But how could the universe have appeared from nothing if this law were inviolable? God's creative word is not bound by the laws of science. God is sovereign over all his creation and is free to carry out his will. Dwell the best that you can on the size of the universe. Think about the incredible power needed to order in order to create it and to think that the God who wields such power loves us, even died for us. How can you learn to draw comfort from this amazing truth? And uh, I'll leave that question open. Just a minute, so we can get your words on tape. It's estimated that there, the total number of atoms in the universe, assuming it's hydrogen, it's 10 to the 80th atoms. Just so that using the equation e equals mc squared, you can actually calculate the number of calories required. It's a, it's a huge amount of energy. It's a huge amount of energy. Yeah, but starting with our original question, we could also say that maybe the law hasn't been violated, so all that energy still originated with God instead that of the Big true. Bang. And so there's no violation of the law if the energy was already there. Yeah. But somewhere along the, the line, the second law had to be violated because if it wasn't, we wouldn't be here. Paul, the, the universe, however big it is, it's finite. We, we understand it as if it's not infinite. And when we assert that God is infinite, we allow God to go outside the three dimensions of this universe and operate from there. And so I personally can easily underst assume that the Lord has access to matter and energy or whatever outside the dimensions of our universe and can violate the first law of thermodynamics that way, import. 
such as when he created loaves and fishes, no? Yeah, and, and in fact, we're going to be getting to that yes. very shortly. Jesus, creator of heaven and earth, and um, this time we'll be reading John 1, 1 through 3, and also John 1, 14. Um, Uh, somebody have uh, have the verse? Do you have it? In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God, and all things were made through him, and without him nothing was made that was made. And 14, and the word was made flesh, and it dwelled among us. And we beheld his glory, the glory of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. And um, now somebody has Colossians 1, 15 and 16. Who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creator? For by him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in the earth, visible and indivisible, whether they be thrones, dominions, or principalities or powers, all things were created by him and for him. And that, by the way, is a direct uh, hit at the Gnostics who thought they knew all kinds of intermediate sets of creation. And he's saying, Whatever is out there, it's God. It's Jesus, in fact, to be specific. And then finally, Hebrews 1, 1 and 2. Hebrews 1, 1 and 2. In the past, God spoke to our forefathers through the prophets in many times and in various ways. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his Son, whom he appointed heir of all things and through whom he made the universe. And uh, the question, I think, answers itself. How do the uh, New Testament writers identify the Creator pretty clearly as Jesus himself? And the implications of the answer are that uh, the one who came and walked with us is, in fact, the one who made everything to begin with. John refers to Jesus as the Word, or Logos, and equates him with God. More specifically, Jesus is the one through whom all things were created. In John's day, the word Logos was commonly used to represent the creative principle. And of course, nowadays, it's commonly used to identify a branch of science. Biology, uh, archaeology, um, John's early readers would be familiar with the concept of Logos as a creative principle or even as a creator. John applied this familiar concept to Jesus, identifying him as the true creator. Jesus, the Logos, the incarnate one who lived among us, was not only present in the beginning, he was the one by whom the universe was created. This means that we could read Genesis 1-1 as, in the beginning, Jesus created the heavens and the earth. Paul's word in Colossians 1 resonate with those of John in the identification of the Creator as Jesus Christ. By him all things were created. Paul adds two other attributes of Jesus. First, he is the image of the invisible God. In our sinful state, we cannot see God the Father, but we can see Jesus. If we want to know what God is like, we can study the life of Jesus. Jesus, uh, John 14, 9, if you have seen me, you have seen the Father. Second, Paul calls Jesus the firstborn of creation in Colossians 1.15. In this context, firstborn does not refer to origin, but to status. The firstborn was the head of the family and the heir of the property. Jesus was the firstborn in the sense that as creator and through the incarnation, he is taking upon himself our humanity. He is the rightful head of the human family. Jesus was not a created being, but rather from eternity he was one with the Father. 
Hebrews 1, 1 and 2 repeats the same points as in all the Colossians passage. Uh, Jesus is appointed heir of all things and is the one by whom the world was created. In addition, he is the exact representation of the Father's nature, another way of stating that he is the image of God. And the, the question is asked, how would you respond if someone were to ask you, what is your God like? And what justification could you give for your answer? And uh, as it turns out, we're... Uh, we're running slightly over. Uh, it is now 11.30, and those of you who have uh, somewhere else to go are uh, invited to do so if necessary. Uh, certainly, the rest of you can stay for a little bit longer, and we'll try to finish the rest of the lesson. And, uh, and also go through a little bit of the <coughs> book that's uh, part of it. Uh, I think it was John who asked Jesus, uh, show us the Father. And he says, I think he was disappointed. He says, uh, I've been with you for three years, and you still don't know me. And he says, he who has seen me has seen the Father. That is correct. And uh, so our God is like Jesus. And if we get a chance, uh, one of the things that we'll try to come back to, even though the uh, person who asked the question is not uh, with us right now, uh, is the is how does God treat uh, those who finally reject him? And uh, Jesus gave us a perfect example. The creator among us, and uh, now I'm not gonna have us read all of those texts because that's a long set of passages. Uh, the first one is uh, John 2, 7 and 11 is the, the marriage at Cana where Jesus created wine out of water by simply speaking or not even actually telling it, just knowing what it needed to be and, and mind control, if you like. Um, John 6, 8 through 13 is Jesus creating uh, bread and fishes from five loaves and two small fishes. And then finally, Jan uh, John 9, 1 through 34, which is, in my mind, the most remarkable miracle of all, even even better than Lazarus from the dead. Um, that's the man born blind. And what do these texts reveal about the creative power of God? And then the quarterly goes on. Each of these miracles gives us a glimpse of God's power over the material world that he himself created. First, what kind of process would be required to change water directly into wine? Well, none that we know of. Indeed, it took an act outside of the laws of nature, at least as we know them, to do what Jesus did here. In the miracle of the fish and loaves, Jesus started with five loaves and two small fish that were enough to feed a multitude and have 12 baskets of leftovers. All the food was made of atoms and molecules. At the end, there were many times more atoms and molecules of food than when Jesus started to feed the crowd. I'd be I'm really interested to know what the DNA of the, of the fish looked like. <laughs> um, maybe get one of some of those baskets and, and snitch it. From where did the additional molecules come from, if not the supernatural intervention of God? And then it goes into what, furthermore, what physical changes happened to the blind man when he was healed? He was blind from birth, thus his brain had never been stimulated to form images from the messages seen, sent by the eye through the optic nerve. So his brain had to be re rewired in order to process the incoming information, form images, and interpret their meaning. Next, there was something wrong with the eye itself. Perhaps some photoreceptor molecules were produced incorrectly as a result of a mutation in DNA, which man sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind. Or perhaps some mutation had occurred at birth in the genes that control the development of the parts of the eye, the retina, optic nerve, lens, and so on. Or perhaps some mechanical damage had occurred that prevented the eye from functioning properly. And of course, Jesus pointed away from all of that uh, whatever the details of the man's blindness, the words of Jesus caused molecules to form in appropriate places, forming functional receptors, neuronal connections, and brain cells so that light entering the eye would form an image and the man would have the ability to recognize images that he had never before seen. Miracles are wonderful when they happen, but what is the danger of making your faith dependent on them? And since... Uh, 
there's a danger of making your faith dependent on them uh, upon what the, should our faith depend. And uh, I, I just want to go to the paragraph above it and, and explain very briefly why the miracle of the man born blind impresses me. If I were God, well, I'm not near smart enough to do that. But if I were, presumably I'd have uh, some kind of a memory bank that would include everything that had been done for, for who knows how long. And I could raise Lazarus from the dead. All I'd have to do is to go at about the time he lost consciousness, remember where all the atoms were, and then rearrange them back to where they were and maybe take out a bunch of bacteria that had been killing him or whatever disease that he died of, you know, fix that, and then he'd come forth from the tomb and, and maybe he wouldn't be quite as good as God did it, but he'd be, he'd be certainly adequate. Um, I would have no clue as to what to do with the man born blind. Yes, I know the general kinds of things that would have to be fixed. Uh, let's say I had to fix his cornea because maybe that's why he got born blind, is that he couldn't see images. Or if it was his lenses or whatever the, whatever the cause was. And I could, you know, just give him somebody else's eyes, basically. Um, what I have a hard time doing is rewiring it so that two things happened. Number one, he could recognize images. That'd be easy enough, borrow from somebody else and put it in his brain. But do it in such a way that it was totally integrated with him. He had an opportunity to deny this. You remember, he gets up, comes back from the pool of Siloam, and he's seeing. And he's really happy. And there's these guys sitting around saying, hey, isn't that the guy that they used to sit and beg at the temple? Another guy says, yeah, that's, that's him, all right. Uh, and the other guy says, no, I don't think that's him, but he sure looks like him. And you can read the account. I mean, that's literally what happened. This gave the guy, if he didn't, he could have said, I remember that guy vaguely somewhere before. But no, when he was pushed, he said, no, I'm, I'm, I'm him. That somehow that ability to see had been not just recreated, but integrated into the guy's former personality so that somehow he knew that that's where he belonged. Like I say, I could pull people back from the dead easier than I can make that work. We have no clue as to how to do that. Questions? Yes. Um, I think that sometimes we're tempted with a little bit of understanding to make a problem more complicated than it needs to be. I was sitting in a class where, it was actually a religion class, where one of our basic science students was trying to explain the conversion of water into wine, and he was going into all kinds of nuclear reactions to produce carbon, out of oxygen and hydrogen and all this kind of stuff. And I was sitting there incredulous, and I was wondering, how is it that we're training these students to, to come up with this kind of stuff uh, and, and yet have so little common sense? Let's take into our minds the basic simple assumption that God, who invented the carbon cycle, would know how to tap into it when needed. So, how do plants create sugar and various flavors and whatnot that we make wine out of? Where do plants get the carbon from? Do they need nuclear reactions and whatnot? They get it from the atmosphere. Eh, thank you. Well, it's all around. In fact, a big wedding party would probably produce quite a bit of carbon dioxide. Plenty of it around, no problem. So why is it that Jesus would be oblivious to such a golden opportunity to merely recycle what's already there? 
That is you see, this is the kind of, you would think that somebody who invented the carbon cycle would be aware of such things. <laughs> yeah. Well, whether, whether he created carbon in the, in the flasks, uh, or the jars, or whether he had it transported, uh, I think the one thing you can say for sure is it's a violation of the second law of thermodynamics. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, and then it has the, this is now Friday's, and we're just about done here with that, this part. Uh, for further study, the work of creation can never be explained by science. What science can explain the mystery of life? And this is Ellen White comments. Uh, the theory that God did not create matter when he brought the world into existence is without foundation. In the formation of our world, God was not indebted to pre-existing matter. On the contrary, all things, material or spiritual, stood up before the Lord Jehovah at his voice and were created for his own purpose. The heavens and all the host of them, the earth and all the things therein, are not only the work of his hand, they came into existence by the breath of his mouth. And that's Ellen White, Testimonies, Volume 8. And then just how God accomplished the work of creation, he's never revealed to men. Human science cannot search out the Most High, the secrets of the Most High. His creative power is as incomprehensible as his existence. And it's probably likely to stay that way for the foreseeable future. Yes? Well, Paul, <coughs> about making wa turning water into wine, you and I would put enough alcohol into a jar of water to make it 4% by weight, and then add a little bit of flavoring, and there we were. <laughs> so we can do it. <laughs> it's just not the way Jesus did it. But it can be done. <clears throat> as far as understanding the mystery of life, at least bacterial and bacterial cells, we understand what life is on, on a physical, biochemical basis. Okay, so I, I don't think that we should, we, should, we should mystify life that way. And, and after that, having said that, we come to the conclusion that only the dear Lord can create life, knowing full well what life is. Well, we're certainly not there yet. We, we can substitute DNA in living organisms, but in terms of, in terms of our being able to construct it from the ground up, no, we're not it's, there. No, Paul, it's not what I'm saying. I'm saying we understand what life is, and it's not DNA and proteins. It is the non-equilibrium um, pathways that are working continuously that creates living pro life processes. But that, of course, doesn't make us capable of creating a living organism, and we'll never be able to do that. Well, it's, it's, it's a little bit like creating a running engine. <laughs> it's easy enough to create an engine that sits there and then start it. But to create a running engine is a little bit harder, shall we say. And uh, we're not there yet. Um, and in class, it says, discuss your answer to Sunday's final question. That's the one um, which I should have put down here. It's uh, The one that says, uh, why is a supernatural creator one who exists alone and beyond the creation the only logical explanation for the creation? And it says, bring your answer to class. And uh, Is that what, what is dealing with the Kalam principle, that anything that uh, began to exist must have a cause for its existence and the cause for the existence of, for the existence of the universe because it began to exist obviously there has to be a cause well it also I think says that uh, information only flows downhill and so in order to in order to get something with that is very rich in information like people, like the original state of the earth, you have to have something that is more rich in information than what it created. And if you think about how rich we are in information, that was somebody <laughs> with a lot of information. We have no clue as to 
Well, I mean, we can kind of, in a sense, recreate ourselves with children. Um, but first of all, everything is going downhill, at least according to John Sanford, and I think he's right. And secondly, um, we have uh, uh, we're really not we're not able to create it without uh, the special reproductive powers that have been given it to us. And uh, so uh, we're, we're nowhere near in, in, in the way of speaking children into existence. Then it says, science talks about what it calls the anthropic coincidences from the Greek word anthropos for man. Uh, the incredibly fine-tuned balance of forces in nature that make it possible for human life to exist. Notice, though, the built-in bias revealed in the word coincidences. If you don't believe in God, you have to attribute these amazing balances to mere coincidence. And uh, it asks the question, why is the belief that these balances were the product of creator God a more reasonable explanation than to simply call them coincidences? And I think for the same reason that if uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger had won the lottery uh, uh, 10 days ago, or t uh, five years ago, say, <coughs> that it would be easier to explain that on the basis of uh, somebody uh, designing that event than assuming that it happened by chance alone. Which is, of course, why um, uh, lotteries in general have a rule that say that if you run the lottery, if you own the lottery, if you work for the lottery company, if you work for anybody who works for the lottery company, that you cannot win the lottery. Yeah, you can get programs that will produce more information than they have to start with. They work on algorithms. Um, there was a study that they were trying to do on how uh, atoms interact they put some basic parameters in and started the program running. It created uh, simulated atoms based on that and then started them interacting with each other. And it produced a lot more information than I had to start with, I promise. Can I that, respond? That, uh, go ahead. There's different types of information. Uh, it's true that uh, that simple algorithmic programs pr can produce a lot of what's called Shannon information, um, a lot more than they started with. But that's not the type of information that life is based on. As far as it's not based on algorithmic information, it's based on compressibility or more like Chatton information. And uh, I don't recognize Shatton or whatever the other term was that you were. Well, this type of information is meaningful information or functional information, which is based on interacting parts that where each part is necessary. It's almost like irreducible complexity. It, each part is necessary for the functional of the emerging system, uh, where the, the system ha requires each individual part to be specifically placed and oriented at the same time for the function of our overall system to be realized. That's a completely different type of information than, than algorithmic information or algorithmic complexity. And, uh, and that type of information cannot be generated by computers or simple algorithms. Maybe I can illustrate it this way. You see this, um, this picture here? Yes. Now I can take a picture of it, compress it into, into a JPEG and perhaps get maybe nine-tenths or more of the information that's actually, that, that you see now, isn't really necessary. That, for example, when you get to this little area here, you can recreate that by simply saying, start with this blue, start with this blue, and shade between them. And, okay. and, that, and, and so what you see as a lot of information, in a sense, is really not very much information at all. That you can, you for example, can if, if you take this page here, you have to put the staple in, 
And if you know what a staple is, you can kind of do that. And then you can have to put a few words in. And the, those words have a very small amount of information, probably less than 1K. Uh, certainly less than uh, 15K. Well, it depends. K. Again, you're talking about bits of information, which is different. That's more like uh, uh, algori uh, algorithmic complexity. Uh, and then what you do is you, you, can, you can take the, the bits, and then you can take the specific font that you have, which is defined. And once you have the yeah. font and the bits, you, you suddenly have taken this down to a very small amount of information. And the rest of that white paper is really not informative. Agreed. Yeah, see, you can generate almost infinite number of bits of, of information using really small algorithms. And it can make them look incredibly complex according to algorithmic definitions of complexity, where basically that definition of complexity means non-predictability. That's what generally people think of a complexity. And that's what the algorithmic definition of complexity is. But that's not the definition of complexity when you're talking the complexity of informational systems when you're talking about functionality. When you're talking about functional information systems where there's meaningful function produced, like language systems or other type of language-based information systems, that type of information is not based on algorithmic complexity. It's based on interactive functionality. And when you're taking, uh, talking about increasing the level of functionality on those systems, you're talking about integrating higher and higher emergent systems uh, together so that you make a higher level system requires more interacting subparts that specifically are required to be there at the same time. That's a whole different definition than, than uh, algorithmic complexity. But, but the idea of your program that is creating this stuff yeah, it's like Tierra, really Tierra, Tierra life programs were a simulation of life and all these things that emerge and, and it becomes more complex over time and an evolutionary algorithm. Uh, those are all based on algorithmic ideas of complexity and they're not really based on functional information. Uh, there's no more additional algorithmic information produced by those programs. They're all, they all start with the same basic simple algorithms and they end there. And there's no, there is no qualitatively improvement. I'm pretty sure the uh, program was designed to produce new algorithms. No, it it's wasn't. I've actually looked into those programs. Okay. And nothing, no new algorithms were produced. Nothing beyond the original algorithm was produced. Yes. As, as I recall, this particular program predicted there were a certain number of molecules that had never been seen before. And <clears throat> when they tried to synthesize these particular model molecules, they found that it worked. Yeah, those things are possible. Because you're searching through a limited, um, a li a limited sequence space of things that you haven't necessarily discovered, but theoretically you know they're they have to be within this space. And you can discover, you can make search algorithms th to search through spaces that you haven't actually explored yet. And that's doable using these simple algorithms. But, and you can discover new things by them. Uh, even like a new cell phone, um, the current cell phones that we have, the antenna that, uh, that is in all cell phones today is based on search algorithms that design them. Uh, to find the most idealistic antenna to function in, in cell phones. And um, so things like that are, are, are able to be achieved in that method. But that's not the same thing as generating additional functional uh, information systems. The same algorithms are there to do the searches. What is an so so how, does, how does these algorithms differ from functionality? You're, the way you're defining it, it seems to be just rewording it in a different way. No, finding something that's, that's, uh, that's not, it's like searching through sequence space for living things. Living things do ha undergo random mutations in the genetic code. And for lower level systems, let's say like three letter words uh, in, in DNA, um, bacteria can mutate and occasionally find a new novel system in sequence space that no one has ever discovered before and it works. It does something brand new. Um, that's doable using a, a simple search algorithm through sequence space. But it's a small sequence space. It's very small. Um, and so you could say, oh, well, you discovered new information. Well, I think he did, but it's only in a very limited sequence space using a very simple search algorithm. 
Now, once you, uh, if, you, if you try to do that at higher levels of sequence space, uh, um, it, the problem expands exponentially and it gets much, much more difficult in a given period of time. But if you break down all these individual parts, it, it eventually adds up to that entire functionality. You would think it would add up, but, but it, it doesn't. Does. It doesn't add up. Uh, you, would think it, you would think initially that it would, but it really doesn't. Because the, the way sequence spaces work, if you try to add them together, uh, you try to put one little part together with another little part, that also requires information on how to do it properly. And you can only do that at very low levels of functional complexity. Once you start moving up a level, each level you take up of the, of the ladder of functional complexity, uh, it gets exponentially harder to do, to link up these smaller little bundles together, to make them work in an integrated manner to produce a higher level system of function. You have to have an algorithm that searches yeah, to searches a higher level sequence space in the same amount of time. And to come up with that algorithm, to produce that algorithm, requires a higher level algorithm. Yeah, it's in, a, in other words, one, one of the things you could say is that your answers are already built in and you just didn't realize it. And the computer unfolds the the potentiality of that answer uh, in and of itself. It's like uh, producing print on a, on a screen. You start out with a message and then you have a, a format that you put it in. Um, and what you have now is an entirely, uh, you have a new message, um, but it's actually implicit in, in, the, uh, in the algorithms that you started out with. Yeah, and if you, if you don't have those original algorithms to start out with, you're not going to get a very high level information system. The only way you can get higher level than what you started with is to have a, an originally higher level algorithm. It's like somebody argued uh, with me personally, they said, well, I, I was asking him, well, you know, how can you explain the origin of a highly symmetrical granite cube, let's say you found it on Mars? And they sa I was like, it would have to have been designed. Everybody would say some, some kind of intelligent alien made that. And someone came back and told me, no, it could have been a giant space worm that did it. Not an intelligent alien, a space worm could have done it. I was like, well, then you have to say, well, th where did the space worm come from? And it has to be a higher level algorithm that explains the space worm. Something smarter than the space worm made the space worm to make the highly symmetrical granite cube. Because you, you can't explain e these things without referring to some higher level algorithm with higher level sources of, of functional information to make them. It, they can't self-generate. Do you believe that um, you would be able to sit down with a pen and paper and design some of these uh, Intel Pentium processors by hand? Oh yeah, I mean, uh, it's within human capacity, maybe my, not my own right now, but it's certainly within the human capacity to do so. Obviously we've done to, so, right? To design a, a Pentium processor by hand. A Pentium processor, we've designed, the, we've designed the Pentium processors, the human mind, and then we've designed algorithms to improve them, right? The, the Pentium, processors were Pentium processors were designed by computers. No, that's not true. Pentium processors are divided by the human mind by hand, and then they were refined you by computers. You cannot place a billion uh, transistors by hand. Well, you well, <laughs> you it can would design. Take you you it can design a long time. You can design an algorithm to place the processors by. Yes. Yes. It's it's designed by. You can right. design it with a. Uh, but see, you don't understand the difference. See the the. The, the concept of how the processor should work is intelligently designed. Then you say, okay, I want to refine this so it works more efficiently. Then you say, how do I do this most effectively? Then you design an algorithm to do that, to search out sequence space like I told you. But it's still at a low level of com functional complexity to do that. The refining process is searching but out. But you're a going from, you're taking a, uh, uh, 8086 processor and using simple algorithms to design a more complex algorithm. 
you know, you, you I don't know if everybody else yes, is interested in this. you're producing a higher level of, of functionality. I can using talk to you personally if you okay. want. Would you like to do that? Sure. Maybe, maybe we should go ahead and, and, uh, uh, and go on uh, from here, but, and, and you guys can enjoy the after uh, Sabbath school conversation. <laughs> it's, it's, an interesting, uh, it's an interesting question. Consider the love of the creators he formed Adam and Eve and provided them with a beautiful garden home, knowing that he himself would suffer and die on Calvary at the hands of the race he was creating. What do we learn about God's love from the decision that he made to go ahead with the creation anyway? That is what she calls self-sacrificing love, literally. <coughs> And then how does the Big Bang Theory compared with the creation statement in Genesis 1.1? Might the Big Bang be a description of the way in which the universe came into existence at God's word? And what issues or problems do you see in this idea? And why would it be dangerous to link our theology to any scientific theory, especially when science so often changes? And I, uh, the last phrase pretty much answers the, the problem, is that we link our theology to science and, and then the science changes and all of a sudden our theology is out the window. Which is what happened with the opponents of Galileo, interestingly enough. And now the adult, uh, the teacher's quarterly simply has four statements and then a little bit of uh, <coughs> Uh, elaboration on them, and I'll just give the, basically what they want us to do is to try to apply these to ourselves. Why is this lesson important to me? What do I need to know from God's Word? How can I practice what I've learned from God's Word? And what can I do with what I've learned from God's Word? And uh, now what I will do is uh, discuss um, the first chapter of Origins, and this will be very brief. Uh, James Gibson, again, authored this book and he mentions that bara, the Bereshit bara Elohim et HaShemayim et Haaretz, bara is the verb and it refers only to activities of God but it does not necessarily refer to creation out of nothing and the best example is that God bara uh, humans but he did so by taking clay in the one case and a rib in another case and uh, built, uh, built two creatures out of them. So creation, now one of the things about creation, interestingly enough, is that creation described in Genesis is a peaceful process. There are no gods fighting. There's no subduing of recalcitrant matter. Uh, God speaks, it gets done. God values humans highly. Um, and he raises the question here, and this is where I was going to get into this, uh, and maybe if we have time we'll discuss it briefly. Did God create the universe? Did he create the solar system? Or did he just simply create the ecosphere? And that's a question. Uh, and uh, he doesn't resolve it in his book. Uh, Job 38, 4 through 7 talks about the sons of God rejoicing uh, for joy. And Lucifer apparently fell before day six of creation, suggesting that uh, it's possible that, Lucifer, that the whole war in heaven only took six days, but I doubt it somehow. And uh, so that I think well, uh, it, it implies that there was time for someone somewhere. I've seen people argue that that's in a separate universe, and for all I know, they may be right. Uh, but then again, for all I know, they may be wrong too. And it does kind of at least raise the question of whether the universe that we see w existed before day six of creation. And when the, the beginning story starts out with water, Bereshit bara Elohim et et ha'aretz, well et ha'aretz, and the, uh, th that is now, it's a contrast. It's a very distinctive way of saying it in Hebrew. Instead of having the verb at the beginning, which is the standard narrative form, it has the noun at the beginning. 
And, and it's not that there isn't a verb there. It's haya. There is a verb. And the water was. And the earth was, I should say. And then there's two more nouns that get the was in front of them before the, the narrative starts again in Genesis 1-3. Um, and so you have this picture of the earth being dark and darkness upon the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God hovering over the water, so there's water there. And then God says, let there be light, and there is light, and, and, and it goes on. So it almost sounds like there was something there beforehand. But as he puts it, regardless of which interpretation we consider to be the best, the Bible is clear that God is the creator of the entire universe. Um, and of our world and its inhabitants, and that he created it all from nothing by the power of his word. Or he created it from his word, if you would prefer to put it that way. He mentions that creation is vast, but that's been known for thousands of years. It's been known from before the time of Christ. When I consider the heavens, the work of your finger, the moon and the stars which you have ordained, what is man that you are mindful of him? Uh, creation is ordered. These are things that you can tell from creation. God's not just random. Uh, the creation has the properties necessary to support life. God cares about life. And he makes the point that if science excludes God at the outset, it will be precluded from finding him at the end. He talks about the Big Bang and that it's evidence for a beginning. It may not be the exact right scenario, but it is a limiting scenario. It is not beyond dispute. I've seen some people argue for a plasma universe, and it certainly has some attractions. And by the way, it doesn't leave you with 13.7 billion years either. Um, and then he finishes up with Genesis 1.1 is one of the most profound statements in Scripture. It identifies God as the creator of all, implying his eternal existence, his omnipotence, and his creative wisdom. It explains the order and design so clearly seen in the universe. It confirms our intuition that there is a reason for our existence and reminds us that our scientific research reach is limited. It is the foundation upon which we build our view of reality and our place in the universe. And in the coming weeks, we're going to try to build that place. Now, my own take is I think that Dr. Gibson is, in fact, finessing the question of what was created during Creation Week. He didn't want to get into it. Uh, and particularly, he finessed it in the quarterly itself. Um, the evidence for the entire universe is largely biblical. It's based on one piece of one verse. It is wa et hakokavim, or and the stars, at the end of the fourth day. Take that verse out, and there's nothing in Genesis that says that. Um, and in fact, that may be a mistranslation, although I think it's probably correct. Uh, it could be, and with the stars. Certainly the thought that, that the stars were created by God is one that would find itself comfortably at home in Genesis 1. Now the evidence against the entire universe, we've talked about the morning stars in Job. We've talked about the case of the fall of Satan. And the other one, which is a physical evidence, but I don't think by that it should be completely negated, is the difficulty of explaining light from other galaxies. Uh, other parts of our galaxies is not as much of a problem, but other galaxies is a major problem. Uh, what do you do with stuff that's, um, the lights have been traveling for a couple million years? How does that fit with a universe as opposed to a solar system that was created? Solar system is no problem whatsoever with that particular problem of light from other galaxies. Now, the evidence for the solar system being created during creation week is largely biblical, and it talks about God creating the greater light and the lesser light, suggesting the sun and the moon, um, suggesting that God created them at a specific time, at least the first day, if not maybe the fourth day of creation. Yes? I think that's more of a reference to the atmosphere, a change in the atmosphere, making it possible to see the stars. That is an explanation. It is a reasonable explanation. And if I were forced to the position of arguing that the matter of the earth were old, I would probably adopt that. 
uh, evidence against the solar system being created on creation week is largely the absence of extinct radioisotopes. Now I'm personally a little skeptical of that. And the reason that I am is because uh, I think we are starting to get evidence that's pretty strong that radioactive decay is not absolutely constant. And there's some evidence even that suggests, although it does not prove, that some of that decay may have happened very rapidly in the past, in the fairly recent past. And if that's the case, that evidence falls apart. For me, it's easier to take the biblical evidence, at, because the sun doesn't have any age to it. There is no, there's nothing in the sun that can tell you that it's really <coughs> 6,000 years old or 8,000 or 20,000 or, or 500 million or 4.6 billion, which is the conventional age. You can't look at the sun and tell that. You could give it a maximum age by saying that if it, if it was older than so old, it would have more helium in it, but you can't give it a minimum age. Uh, the solar system itself outside of the sun is primarily the result of um, radiometric dating. I have reservations about that. But uh, uh, if you had everything else, including the Earth, but not the sun, and God created the sun, interestingly enough, the lesser light would come into being <coughs> at the same time because the lesser light does not, in fact, have light of its own. It's all reflected off of the greater light, or a reflection of the greater light. So if God chose to create the sun and nothing else, the sun and, and uh, the body of the earth, you would get an, an explanation for the solar <coughs> system pretty easily. Um, and part of the reason why I think that he's not trying to emphasize that is because it creates endless arguments. And the other part of the reason why I think he's not trying to emphasize that is because the arguments are about very small points where our knowledge is incomplete and, and where the theological <coughs> implications are close to non-existent. Mm. Uh, and uh, I think that that's uh, that I think that this is uh, uh, almost uh, the equivalent of the uh, medieval argument of how many angels could dance on the head of a pin, and I think that's why he, he <coughs> really isn't going into it. Um, if you were to ask me what my personal favorite theory is, uh, if you'd asked me 20 years ago, I would have probably said that the ecosphere is what God created. And I would have given, given an explanation very similar to yours about how the, the atmosphere cleared up, uh, was totally dense on day one, and the sun <coughs> simply couldn't be seen. And then it cleared up a little bit on day, t uh, day one. It cleared up a little bit more on day two. And it finally got fairly clear on day four. And so now, now the greater and lesser lights could <coughs> be seen. Um, and I don't think that anybody who holds that view is a bad heretic that needs to be run out of uh, the church or is in danger of losing salvation or anything like that. Mm -hmm. um, my change has been largely because I heard the arguments for the solar system being an old one and, um, and then saw that uh, there's some pretty good evidence for rapid radioactive decay and in that case, I the scientific argument has, for me, fallen apart. And so the biblical argument, even though it's weak, I think kind of uh, holds the field. But somebody who feels differently, uh, again, I don't feel that this is worth our arguing about. Uh, yes, yeah, Ariel. Yeah. Uh, uh, I understand you have a different opinion. Yeah. <laughs> there are uh, some other texts in the Bible that uh, we need to keep in mind in this picture here, which uh, it's true that uh, Genesis 1 in the first verse and so on seem to be before God's creation starts. Uh, because, you know, when he starts speaking, 
Uh, apparently there's a nerve there first, at least the sequence seems to suggest that a little bit. The, uh, but I'm referring to Psalms uh, 24.2, which speaks of the earth being created uh, out of water. I'm speaking of Second Peter 3, verse 5. Yes. Again, stating that the earth was created out of water. I'm speaking of Job uh, 28, uh, somewhere in there, 19 or so on, where it speaks of uh, the earth being there with a dark swaddling band. Uh, the earth must have had some, some uh, time of existence in that state for Job to describe it that way, at least for the book of Job to describe it that way, and uh, God speaking there in, in that uh, book. Uh, but uh, so, you know, uh, I think uh, the biblical picture, uh, I'll admit, uh, day four sounds like the sun and the stars were created on day four. Uh, so that's the other side. On the other hand, part of my bias, uh, I think, uh, for thinking there was a matter of the earth here before creation is, it does help me to a certain extent uh, in explaining old radiometric dates uh, and those that you find far, far higher up in the geological record and so on that's inherited from matter before. Uh, and not having to give up uh, too much uh, scientific integrity in the process. Uh, but that, I just wanted to present it that, that side of the issue. No, and I, I think that those, especially the ones in the, in the biblical, uh, are, are valid arguments and uh, uh, need to be taken into consideration when one is forming one's worldview. I think the other thing is it's probably important for all of us to admit that we weren't there, we don't have a video. Um, we are dependent on, uh, as one of the lessons we'll say later on, looking through a glass darkly, trying to figure out exactly what happened with creation. And I, I, think, that, I think that for any of us to be too dogmatic about that, I think is, uh, is a major mistake. Um, <clears throat> I'd like to say a word about being dogmatic word in favor of being dogmatic. Um, <clears throat> the spirit of prophecy tells us that the Lord himself described the events of creation to Adam and Eve, and so, and which was then passed on to subsequent generations. So I think that it is not a far-fetched idea that the description that we read in Genesis 1 and 2 are in fact coming from the creator himself. In terms of well, there's the a higher critical point that I think that goes with that, and that yeah. is that, <clears throat> well, uh, Genesis two and onward are written in what is now in considered the Yahwistic style. Yeah. Genesis yeah. one, interestingly, mm -hmm. is usually put priestly because it's in a, it's a different uh, it's a different style. And and the interesting thing of it is priestly style, which is where it's usually shoehorned into, is boring and concerned with uh, uh, priestly functions and uh, you know, the stuff you read in the middle of Leviticus. This is nothing like that. This is simple, it's beautiful, it's elegant, it's polished, it's as if it came from the hand of the Lord, whereas yes. the other ones are our human ancestors exactly. talking about themselves. Okay. Thank you. So, the, In terms of the definitive <clears throat> statement in the Bible regarding creation, we must look at the Ten Commandments, which we believe were written by the finger of God, in the, etched in stone, and we know very well what it says. Yes. That God created heavens and the earth, heavens referring to the sky in six days. And right. so that, I think, is, should be the foundational point from which we then go. In terms of envisioning the creation week and the fourth day, we can also postulate that the sun was already created right at the offset, but it was not ignited. That the mass of the sun plus the planets were all in place, all at once created once in a balanced way. Fourth day was the ignition of the nuclear fusion. And then, and 
And I, I like the parenthesis idea for the stars. The stars are simply mentioned in parenthesis, but the uh, sun and the moon appearance of their, their appearance and afford, they can be a, understood to be an ignition. As far as the yes. radio and metric- Interestingly enough, some of the stars would ignite, specifically the ones named Mars and Mercury and Jupiter and, and well, Venus. Well, they would, but, and, and in fact, the other planets are like, look like little miniature suns waiting to be ignited in a, at a future date, Jupiter and so on, because Possible. their composition. In terms of the radioactive dating, we can, <coughs> fall back to the observation that the Earth was created with an apparent age, at least in the organic phase, and we can postulate back into the inorganic part too. So that's all I have to say. And therefore, the uh, definitive beginning is, is, is very difficult to come up with. No, and th that's a very interesting point. Uh, we don't really understand how stars get started. And for all we know, the sun may have been sitting there uh, quietly behaving itself until God said, okay, now it's time for light. Um, and and that, I think that that idea preserves the, the creation idea. Well, um, I, have, I have every confidence that when, <coughs> that when the universe was created, whenever it was and however it was, that that was God's doing too. Uh, but anyway, uh, that's that's kind of the discussion that I that uh, that uh, uh, in the book, uh, uh, Dr. Gibson talks about. Whereas uh, in the Sabbath school lesson, he kind of leaves it out. And I think the reason is because if you think about it, now we've oh, it run over. Uh, close to an hour now. <laughs> How they're ever going to cram this into 30 minutes, I don't know, except that uh, they'll probably get off on s one little yeah. subject and then finish it. They get so. through two pages, they'll do well. Yes, they get through two pages, they'll do very well. <coughs> so, uh, anyway, that's kind of my, uh, I guess, final comment for now. Uh, this is going to make a very interesting video for anybody who wants to look at it. <laughs> so at this point, I will leave you with God's blessing, and we will uh, uh, we will be back next week, and uh, we'll see if we can make it a little shorter next time. 